Hello, everyone, and welcome to the physician-led webinar on cardiopulmonary renal management of COVID-19 patients. CHS Solutions is honored to host this educational webinar in an effort to provide valuable, real-world insight on treating patients with COVID-19. All participants will be in listen-only mode. We encourage attendees to ask questions as they have them via the chat function on the right-hand side of your screen. Before sending a question, please be sure to change the recipient to all panelists to ensure we see your questions. Participants of this call are advised that the audio of this conference call is being broadcast live over the internet and is also being recorded for playback purposes. A recorded version of this webinar will be available at www.chf-solutions.com. Here's a copy of our forward-looking statements and the Aquidex FlexFlow Smart Flow system, all available on our website. Here are our panelists' disclosures. Today's webinar is being moderated by Dr. Daniel Goldstein. Dr. Goldstein is a professor and vice chairman of the Department of Cardiothoracic Surgery okay. at Montefiore Medical Center in New York City. He has been involved in treating patients affected by COVID-19 in one of the critical areas of the country and continues to share valuable observations through social media. I would like now to turn the call over to Dr. Goldstein, who will introduce the webinar panelists. Thank you, Dr. Goldstein. Thank you very much, Linda. Uh, I want to thank uh, the CHS Solutions team uh, for organizing this webinar in short order. We hope you will come out of this with a better understanding about the medical man management of COVID patients, and in particular, the issues surrounding the development and treatment of renal dysfunction in severely and critically ill ICU patients. I should emphasize that all of what we will hear from our, uh, us four, the clinicians on this uh, phone call, uh, reflect our opinions and do not necessarily reflect the opinions of CHS Solutions as a company. I also want to underscore how important it is for the audience to participate. Uh, we, wel we welcome any and all questions about the pandemic, and we'll do our best to answer them. While some of the focus will be on the kidney, I would like to keep the discussions as holistic as possible, as there is an inextricable connection between lungs, heart, kidneys that is impacted by any therapy we offer. I think you're all aware of how asymmetrically New York has been hit with this disease. We're not only the U.S. epicenter, but in fact the world's epicenter of the disease. As of this morning, there were over 160,000 cases in New York, 7,100 deaths, 18,000 people remain hospitalized, and about 3,000 are in ICUs. In fact, about one New Yorker is dying every two minutes. For this reason, we are very fortunate to have three, uh, we have convened three experts from New York who collectively have amassed a broad experience treating this disease. Dr. Maria DeVita is a nephrologist at Lenox Hill Hospital in Manhattan. Dr. Mario Lumi is an intensivist at Mount Sinai Hospital in Manhattan. And Dr. Giovanni Piovesana is a cardiac surgeon in Albany. So we have represented here three different specialties, which is quite nice, which will add different points of view to our conversations. So why don't we get started? Uh, started. Uh, Giovanni, why don't you get us started with your case report? Yes, thank you, Dan. So I'll go to the next slide here. And I just wanted to specify it's Albany, Georgia, and not Albany, New York. But we got hit pretty pretty hard from the COVID here as well. So let me let me start by telling you the story that's going to start the conversation about this. And the story is kind of the typical story of the COVID patient. That's a 73-year-old man with hypertension, dementia, presented with dyspnea, fever. Uh, we tested for COVID and it was COVID positive. So plus day one, you can see chest x-ray here, plus day one, creatinine was 1.7, CRP 14.9, got a CK of 744. Broca oxygen was 233 and LDH 457. So it was on the floor initially. And then uh, next, Linda, please. Okay, so for the next few days, we put them on uh, um, supplemental oxygen and required using the supplemental oxygen. Uh, next. So on post of day seven, that was his chest x ray. His creatinine kept 
rising uh, 2.05, 2.68, uh, 4.1. So you got to be intubated on, post on, on uh, day seven. You can see the chest X-ray, the evolving of the bilateral infiltrate on the chest X-ray. Uh, next, was in the ICU for the following days. So on day 11, this was kind of the situation for this patient. He's, he was acidotic with a pH of 7.2. Uh, you require press support for hemodynamic uh, um, His FIU2 was around 60%, and he, he looked at from a clinical standpoint, uh, both volume overloaded as well. So uh, let me let me give you a little bit of scenario right now. On the uh, go back one, Linda, please. One more. Okay. So at this point, so uh, right, we are about a three bed hospital, 400 bed hospital, and right now we have 139 patients uh, COVID positive. We got four COVID ICU dedicated patients with about 50 patients. So on day 11, uh, the patient required hemodialysis at that point. He met all the criteria for hemodialysis. But there were no uh, hemodialysis machine available. So they were all using other patients. So uh, I'm, a, I'm a cardiothoracic surgeon. We were using the Aquadex to treat uh, volume overload patient post open heart. And uh, so we said, why don't we at least try to temporize this patient by using the Aquadex machine, which is an ultrafiltration machine, basically. So we came up with this uh, sort of uh, uh, what we call uh, Aquadex renal rescue protocol in trying to temporize and stabilize the patient while the hemodialysis machine was available. So next, Linda. And I can go, um, yeah, later we can talk specifically about uh, the, the specific of this, but basically we run the uh, aqueous machine in terms of ultrafiltration to um, treat the volume overload. At the same time, we put the patient on a um, bicarb drip, and we just say activate to manage the uh, electrolyte impairment. We got about four liter removal of the patient overnight, uh, and uh, with decrease of the FIU2 requirement and increase in the, in the pH. And that allowed us uh, to kind of stabilize the patient for the next uh, at least 24 hours until the hemodialysis machine became available. Next. So in the course of the patient right now is still intubated in the ICU and is kind of alternating uh, rounds of hemodialysis versus uh, Aquadex if we have only to manage his uh, um, fluid overload and not the electrolyte. Um, of the patient. Next. So, what we, in terms of our experience, what we are learning, we will want to share and learn from everybody else if they have experience like that. That we can use the ultrafiltration in three scenarios, basically. Uh, number one, if the on patient with fluid overload, and we can use it similar to congestive heart failure patient or post-open heart. Once they don't respond to a diuretic challenge, so you can use to take the fluid off, off from them. And more important, in this COVID situation with the resources are sometimes limited because of the overload of patient, we can use a temporary measure, and I stress again, it's a temporary measure to stabilize the patient uh, until you got a hemodialysis machine available. And the third thing, and we, we can talk more about the hemodynamics, the impact of, of the uh, ultrafiltration machine, it can be used as some sort of hemodynamic friendly hemodialysis if the patient is hemodynamically unstable, uh, unstable, because the impact on the hemodynamics is minimal when you use this type of machine. I'll give, so that's kind of the story of where we can start a discussion, but I'll give it back to you, Dan, right now. Great, Giovanni, thank you. So I have a couple of questions that some of the audience might not be familiar with the system. Can the system, can you describe the components of the system and then explain to us, uh, is this a system that has to be, can only be accessed peripherally or can it be put centrally? And as you know, all these people are prothrombotic, and um, most of them high elevated uh, uh, D dimers, in addition to the uh, elevation of pro inflammatory markers. Can you comment on the anticoagulation yeah. uh, regimen that you're using in order to ensure that the system doesn't clot? Yeah, sure. So, briefly, the machine is, uh, is an ultrafiltration machine and is a pump. So, it he has a console. A pump and kind a of filter that takes volume out of the patient. Doesn't uh, change the electrolyte component, so we will not correct uh, hyperkalemia or acidosis in the machine per se. Is, uh, it can be used either uh, peripherally with peripheral cannulation or with central cannulation, and I'll tell you more about 
Usually what we use here is, is a central cannulation because all of these patients usually have a, are intubated in this COVID patient, but they can still, the, the company tells you you can use it as a perimeter as well with a six French uh, catheter. In our experience, we, we've been using this with central cannulation at the same point. The extra volume, the extra corporeal volume of the machine on the pump is only 35 ml. So when you start the pump, you, you don't have that much of a hemodynamic impact on the patient. Uh, in terms of access, what we use right now, we generally put dialysis catheter on this patient because most of the patients, they will eventually need dialysis. At least, uh, so there's a chance they might need that. Yeah, it's a dialysis catheter, which is a 16 French. The, we run the machine with a flow of 40 ml a minute, and we uh, target the ultrafiltration. What we find out, we target the ultrafiltration at about 500 ml an hour right away, which is the maximum amount that the machine can take off from the patient per hour, in, in order just to be able to maximize the fluid removal during the filter life, because the filter eventually closed. And that brings me back to this. What you were saying is absolutely right. So what we found out that these patients are all prothrombotic. So if, for example, in the post-op uh, post heart patient, we were running this patient on a um, fixed rate of heparin, about 600 uh, units per hour. But with this patient, we run heparin with a high-dose heparin protocol, and we aim at an APT target around the hundred for them. One thing that we find out is instead of running the heparin systemically, we run the, the heparin uh, through a side arm right before the filter on the machine. That allows you to have the maximum concentration of heparin in the filter and prolong the filter, uh, the filter life itself before it gets lost. And the, Great. The machine, that, that's very helpful. Uh, Medi, uh, you know, it's hard to, a lot of these people are in ICUs, they've been retrofitted. Um, we're short staffed with nurses. Sometimes we have nurses that are not particularly skilled to taking care of ICU patients. You know, eyes and nose sometimes are difficult to obtain in these people. X-rays you might or might not get. So, so what do you do to, to, to measure the volume status of the patient? That was uh, directed to uh, Dr. Ulumi. I guess he's not available. Uh, Maria, can you answer that yeah, question? Sure, sure. So, um, you know, it's it's been difficult. We are, we do have central lines and we do have central pressure monitoring. We do use the ultrasound, though we don't want the equipment in the room so much. And the difficult juggle here, which um, we haven't been able to thread the needle on, but I think this is a big problem with the respiratory failure anyway, is that they are so congested in their lungs, but intravascularly they're not always so wet. So what we're trying to do is measure their CVPs and, and you know, should we target a 12, should we target a 6, should we target lower? I think those are all individually based upon the patient's the given patient's condition in the moment. So somebody else will be happy if we can get the CVP down a little bit. Somebody else, we want to push it down maybe to six. Other people, we want to keep it higher because their blood pressures are off. And it really is a case-by-case -case basis. We're seeing all different gradations of respiratory failure and pulmonary congestion on their CTs and chest X-rays. And from the volume blood pressure-wise as a nephrologist, we're seeing all sorts of blood pressures. I mean, it's easy to sort of pull fluid off somebody when their blood pressures are running 120, 30, we're seeing a lot of uh, hypotensive patients. Um, and then just also, I just want to give you one little background. Again, I'm uh, Dr. DeVito from Lenox Hill Hospital. We usually run around 300 to 400 patients on a normal working day. Right now we have uh, 305 COVID positive patients and we have 82 ICUs. We have about 35 people with kidney failure in the hospital now and about um, um, 50 to 60 percent of those are all AKI. That's great, Maria. Uh, so if I understand correctly, you're doing sort of what we're doing, which is everybody gets a central venous pressure line. Is that correct? Right. And then how much – yeah, right. Now, everybody gets one. How we're interpreting it is the variable parts. So I think it's good to have, and if we really aren't sure what to do, then we'll sort of use the CVP as a guidance. But, again, we're trying to limit exposure to the teams going into the rooms, fill, you know, moving the stuff around. So it's, it's helpful, but it, it's not like everybody we know exactly what their CVP is. We sort of have a plan in the morning, say, okay, okay, the CVP was this, whatever, now let's just fiddle with that, but we're not getting CVPs every two hours on these people. It's just too complicated, it's too hectic, and, um, and we don't want the staff to be exposed that long. Do we have Dr. Maddie on the line? 
Not really. Giovanni, do, are you using Swan Gans catheters on any of these patients? You know, a lot of them, not a lot of them, but a proportion of them are going into heart failure, which has been ascribed uh, either to myocarditis or perhaps the result of the cytokine storm effect on the, on the heart. Can you comment on the use of Swan Gans and maybe echocardiograms? Yeah, good question. So uh, we, use, we do not use Swan Gans on the COVID patient routinely. Uh, what we use is, uh, and I think is a good, good adjunct as well, we use the flow track system, which uh, allows you without floating a PA catheter just to uh, give you the SBR stroke volume and the cardiac injury and the cardiac output continuously. So that's one, another adjunct that we use in terms to evaluate the intravascular volume of the patient themselves, as you know, as uh, Dr. DeVita was saying, something that can help. So we base that on the stroke volume as well to see if the patient needs to be uh, repleted intravascular. One thing that we use, uh, you can take off about four liter, five liter of volume in, in overnight on a patient by using the Aquadex. And if the, um, and if you see that the stroke volume goes down, you think the patient is intravascular depleted, what we do, we give, just give some albumin, just try to increase the uh, intravascular volume of the patient, and at the same time, take the uh, volume out from the extravascular space. So that's what we I agree really with that, yeah. Cover. Yeah. Dr. Matty, any comments about that? I'm afraid we don't have them connected. Uh, Maria, I have a question. Do um, you have a sense of why the kidneys are getting affected with such frequency? Um, you know, these people are not, by and large, in cardiorenal uh, failure. They're not necessarily in cardiogenic shock. And we've seen a lot of people with normal hemodynamics, they're going into renal failure. They're not getting necessary nephrotoxic drugs. Do you have any sense of what's happening ideologically? Yeah, so um, I don't have a very specific answer, but I can give you our experience and then just what I've been hearing from colleagues. One is, this is, I agree with you, this is definitely the virus is causing some sort of process in the kidney. So it's not a volume thing. It's, it's not um, a glomerulopathy or something like that. There's something going on. And I think that for those listening, I don't think people are really well aware of the fact that the kidneys are definitely going to take a hit in this process. It's, it's a really overwhelming at times to sort of see the number of cases we're seeing. And what's also very interesting is that those people who have a normal creatinine on day one, by when they get the cytokine storm and get the renal failure, their BUNs and creatinines are going up in the 150 to 200 range, you know, usually an 80 or to 100 BUNs like off the wall high. But I'm deciding today which, you know, five or six people I'm going to dialyze in what order, and I'm doing the 170 BUN first. I'm doing the 152 BUN second. The person who has the BUN of 80, I probably won't get to today, whereas on a normal day I would be doing that. So now getting back to the pathology is, you know, we don't know. It's some sort of a tu acute tubular injury. There's a, uh, a pretty renowned pathologist, renal pathologist out of Vanderbilt. Her name is Agnes Fogo, and she is – we just got a little tweet from her earlier this week, but she's putting together an article from the uh, people in Wuhan, China, that's going to come out in Kidney International pretty soon. But in her little uh, tidbit, she sort of said that, that there definitely is acute tubular injury. There's some aggregates of RBCs, but no real microthrombi, because I, I know I've been talking to some con colleagues about that. And there are virus particles that are seen in the podocytes and in the tubules. So there's some sort of direct insult to that. And we don't know. That's it. We don't know anything more except really high BUNs, very high potassiums, low bicarbs, and it's affecting the kidney directly, not as a secondary process. Yeah, there's also the, the observation by Chinese uh, scientists that there's a high concentration of ACE2 receptors in the proximal tubules, correct? Right. And Right, and then how that's playing in there, we're not really sure, but that's definitely in there. I know early on there was a, uh, some conversation of should we be st stopping ACEs and ARBs there, and we really didn't know. I, as a clinician, haven't changed any of my outpatient protocols uh, in terms of ACEs and ARBs. But that's a very compelling thought, and we'll just have to wait and see how it plays out. I don't want to get ahead of the data here. Yeah. Is Dr. Maddie on the line now? Yes, he's not. Um, Giovanni, going back to your patient, can you tell us what uh, what kind of medications he got as adjunctive therapy, if any? Well, we we were 
use the right now what we're using in terms of uh, we don't use routinely steroids if that's one of the the question unless the patient is refractory to refractory to uh, pressure and any shock. Um, you get you receive hydrochloroquine and uh, azithromycin at the beginning we use that for four days and at the beginning we're we're using that only on patients that were requiring o, um, oxygen supplement right now we have everybody which is uh, which come to the hospital and is positive at this point maria is that what you guys doing also with your patients yeah, we're, almost we're, everybody's we're, going into an intermalarial yeah so most of what, most people when they come in are sick enough that they're they are getting the azothi um the uh, z pack and the chloroquine and then we're starting a bunch of the clinical trials to look at it in a more symptomatic way with um the yeah, six blockers and um some um, antiretroviral medications uh I'm not so well versed in them because we don't really have data as to what's going, but I know we're starting about four different stu- the, the my Northwell group has started about four different uh, protocols. Yeah, so for the benefit of the audience, there's a, there's a few uh, things that are being investigated. One are antivirals and remdesivir, which is an RNA polymerase inhibitor, probably the most, the, the one that's uh, been tested the most, uh, and it's part of at least four randomized clinical trials in the United States and China. The other kind of therapies we're using are uh, monoclonal antibodies directed at uh, interleukins, which are the sort of the cytokines that uh, that are involved in the cytokine storm, and most of them are IL-6 inhibitors. Uh, Teclizumab is probably the most uh, frequent one. Cerilumab is the other one. So there's a lot of interest in these technology and these uh, medications. One problem we have, Maria, is that you require require a very decent GFR in order to be on those uh, trials. Right, right. So, um, and you know, I would, and again, I think 50 to 60, uh, whatever I said, uh, about 30 to 40 percent of people. 25 to 35 percent of people have the acute kidney injury, and that's just an estimate. So the rest of them could do it, but right, we're sort of cautiously looking at the patients with kidney disease, and they're not really getting into the, into these trials um, at the start. Now maybe things will change in another little bit because everything is so dynamic. You know what what I'm saying at eight o'clock in the morning isn't necessarily true at two o'clock in the afternoon in, in New York City. Uh, I think we can all speak to that. That is so true. This is really shaking the way we, we take care of patients uh, incredibly. And, uh, Giovanni, I have one question. Uh, you know, we've noticed a tremendous reduction in the uh, presentation of people with acute cardiac surgery emergencies. So we're all used to seeing aortic dissections walk in the door, uh, waking us up at all hours of the night. We've seen people with severe endocarditis with a heart block that require emergent surgery. Acute myocardial infarctions need to go to the OR. We're seeing none of that. <laughs> and the same has been described in Spain and Italy. That's right. What What has yeah. your experience been up there, and what role do the surgeons have now that we're not operating? So, you know, I agree with you. That's the observation that we have right here as well. I think it's... Uh, there are two components to that. Uh, one is some hospital, for example, are on divert, on ER divert, unless they are a COVID patient, and so they may just go to uh, to a reference center or different hospital that have the capability to treat that. But I think most importantly, some of the patients they they might have fear of going to the emergency room because of the fear of COVID, and so either they don't come to the emergency room or either they come too late and you can operate on them or they just die at home and they don't come here in time. So that's, that's I think, what, what the, the two aspects of why we're seeing a decrease in these uh, emergency surgery as well. Uh, in terms of the surgery, what we, what we did here, uh, and I think the word is re-engineering what you're doing or re-engineering the entire hospital. That's what we're doing. So the surgical team right now is helping the intensivists in terms of uh, um, procedural um, help us put in chest tube, central line, uh, hemodialysis catheter, try to take the workload off from the intensivist. We work at managing the intensive uh, care patient as well. And But this is not just only for surgery. The entire hospital is being re-engineered. We switch from what can be a job description uh, specific task to an ability specific task. So it's not what you are, but what you can do to help you. We're all in this together. So that's the way we are engineer the hospital. Maddie, I think you're on the line now. Is that correct? Uh, can you hear me now? Yes, terrific. Yes. So a couple questions for you. What in general has been your approach to uh, 
anticoagulation, systemic versus low molecular weight heparin on these patients? And number two, do you have a sense in Mount Sinai what the mortality is of being intubated and what the mortality is if you're intubated and develop renal failure? Uh, as far as the anticoagulation, we came with the protocol for all the severe COVID patients who came to the intensive care. Uh, they are going to be on a fully anticoagulation, like a pulmonary embolism protocol. If the creatinine is up, they are going to be on the uh, unfractionated heparin. And according to some of our patients, they are on the Lobanox. And we adopt this one since last week, uh, which all the patients. Having said that, when the COVID patient they admitted, then they are going to be very aggressive as far as the prophylactic dose of the on, uh, low molecular or apaxiban. So that's as far as our protocol. Regarding your second question, as far as, uh, unfortunately, uh, some of our patients, when they have an art with the multi-organ failure, uh, the outcome is not that great. Probably the survival right now, as of right now, is around, around 20%. Having said that, if you just have a patient has an art as a single organ failure, so the, our survival is much better. So we were able to, I can tell you just, you know, first-hand experience since around uh, two weeks ago, I have a patient. He's around with a single organ failure. Three of them I was able to extubate and send them to the floor. But when the uh, other organ is involved, particularly kidney and the liver, uh, I'm not sure necessarily is the kidney as a uh, one factor, but when they get to the multi-organ failure, survival is not that great. Yeah. That's sort of what we're seeing. Maria, I have a question. So you have at your disposal a tremendous armamentarium for renal replacement therapies, right? You have Aquidex, you have SLED, you have CVVH, you have conventional hemodialysis. Can you sort of take us through, let's assume you had availability of all, any of those, which you don't uh, because of staffing or number of machines. But if you did, what is the perfect sort of phenotype of patient for each one of those? Right. So I'll, I'll just start by going through the way I like to think of all this equipment. So you have your acute hemodialysis machine, which is your traditional machine. It requires nursing care, and it does very efficient dialysis clearances and very efficient fluid removal. Sometimes the fluid removal can be so efficient that it's too um, quick for the patient. So if I want to take three kilos off a patient uh, in a three-hour hemodialysis treatment, I might not be able to succeed because it's a little too fast. But it's hemodialysis rapid fix. Then we can move over to the slower continuous renal replacement therapies. And those are a gradation lower, in ter well, multiple gradations lower in terms of the efficiency. But you do it over a longer period of time, so it's a tortoise and a hare type of analogy. Uh, hemodialysis will fix the potassium in three hours, and a co continuous renal replacement therapy will fix the potassium by tomorrow morning. Uh, the same thing with the fluid. It can do it consistently and slowly. And then we have the aquaphoresis machine. Uh, and the aquaphoresis machine, as was mentioned earlier, just removes fluid. And it can move fluid. What, what's very nice about the aquaphoresis machine compared to the other two so it's a smaller machine, it has a very small extracorporeal volume compared to the other two pieces of equipment, and there are literally two buttons on it. It's, you know, make the blood flow 10, 20, 30, or 40 milliliters a minute, or the UF rate anywhere from 10 to 500 milliliters an hour. And the nurses don't get intimidated by it as much. Um, the critical care nurses in our institution do the aquaphoresis and the CVVHs. The hemodialysis nurses have to do the hemodialysis. So what I do is I don't really think of, do they need hemo, do they need this or that, I say, well, what needs to get fixed? So getting back to your original question is that if someone has a potassium of 7.6, I'm going to do an acute hemodialysis on that patient. Uh, if somebody just needs a, has a BUN of 150, um, I might do a hemodialysis, but I also can do a slow continuous um, process. Um, what we've been doing with the aquaphoresis, because there is a lot of uh, component of acute renal failure, is we've been using the aquaphoresis, and I've done this with other patients even before the pandemic, I'm using it as a quick fix for the fluid removals in those people where I don't want to activate my acute hemodialysis machine and my acute hemodialysis nurse or my slow continuous dialysis because I don't need all that clearance. 
Um, and it's wonderful. We can get it up and going in 20 or 30 minutes, um, and then you can run it, like was mentioned earlier, you know, 100 an hour, 500 an hour. For instance, last night I had a patient, a hemodialysis patient, who was doing fine, finally got extubated, was doing okay, but needed a little bit more oxygen by the uh, middle of the afternoon, and they wanted me to do a hemodialysis on the patient, and I, I just didn't have the equipment, and his electrolytes were fine, so we just hooked him right up to the aquaphoresis ma- machine and took off a liter and have a fluid over a few hours, and then, then we were done. I just didn't have to worry about him for the rest of the day. And for me, that was a tremendous resource because I didn't have to use my nurse to go sit in the room for another two hours. Uh, we just set up the machine, put the machine in the room. We stepped out of the room, and everything got done in, in a very satisfactory way. And then I, he was supposed to get a regular hemodialysis today, which he had already. And he's doing uh, relatively quite well compared to the way he was doing on Monday and will probably be stepping out of the ICU because we didn't have to reintubate him yesterday. Yesterday. Um, so I just look at it as what do I need to fix right now? What do I need to fix at you know one o'clock or two o'clock or whatever time it is? And I just use the machines interchangeably, uh, and it's really a good resource. That's one of the best explanations I've heard uh, uh, on our RTs. Thanks, Maria. So we have some questions from the audience. Linda. Sure. Thank you. Uh, so this is a two-part question. Uh, what tools were they using to measure hypervolemia in terms of assessment? And then what were the diuretic dosing strategies leading up to either aquaphoresis or CRRT and in terms of um, was there a urinary output goal or cutoff? I'll take that one. Um, yeah. I, I, you know, so I think it's very hard to assess the volume. What we're trying to do is keep um, some idea of the I and O's and the central pressures to some degree and certainly blood pressures and, and chest x-ray findings, though, of course, with, the, with this COVID pneumonia, it's sort of hard to tease that out. But that being said, um, most of the patients with the acute kidney injury that I've that we've been involved with develop an oligoanuria. So we are trying to give them, you know, usually somebody on the floor or in the IC will give them like 40 of a, of a loop, and we'll come over and say, no, give 120 of the loop. Let's see what happens. I, in my clinical practice, am very fond of continuous drips of loop diuretics. We have not done any of those drips. I just think they're too tedious. And if I need the fluid off right now, I don't have four hours to wait to see if it's going to work. So I give them a big blast of a diuretic. And then if it doesn't work, I do some sort of renal replacement therapy, as I just described. Yeah. Maddie, uh, is there any, any other uh, question from the audience, Linda? Sure. Um, this question actually is, I think, um, maybe related to the case. In retrospect, do you think that earlier use of the ultrafiltration may have flattened the creatinine curve? I can. Do you want to talk about that? Or? Giovanni, you want to take that? Well, either way, either way, I can. I um, So if I can add something to this, uh, it's, it's possible, it's possible. And one way that we look at this, uh, aquaphorase machine and ultrafiltration machine is some sort of deloading actually the work on the kidney. And uh, I, I would like to see, to hear what uh, Dr. Devere and Dr. Lomi think about that. But in terms of decreasing the CDP and uh, not, uh, uh, and still rec- be able to give a good perfusion of the kidney by don't uh, impacting the hemodynamics so much, at this point you kind of deload the kidney from the work. And so it, it's a possibility. I just see this uh, for the patient that doesn't need uh, um, potassium replacement or uh, potassium correction or doesn't need uh, an acidosis correction. I see that as sort of deloading the kidney from the work. But w- what, do you, what do you guys think? So, so uh, David, again, I think that um, – to so – for the first part of the question, just to, for clarification, the ultrafiltration will not do any clearance. You may get some removal of the creatinine just by convection, like solvent drag. You know, it's just going to yeah. come out. But uh, it, technically, it's, you're not going to change your creatinine at all. You're not going to change anything. You're not going to change your sodium, your potassium, That's your right. bicarbonate. All right? So it's a pure ultrafiltrate. If you sent a chem panel from the ultrafiltrate, it should be exactly what it is in the plasma. Yeah. All right. So you're not going to get. So you're not going to flatten your creatinine curve by ultrafiltration. You'll improve the volume status. Um, mm-hmm. And yeah, Giovanni, I agree that what we're trying to do. I when I'm teaching this to my fellows and to other. Um, colleagues in the hospital here, I like to think of the aqua 
paresis as siphoning off fluid um, mm -hmm. without impairing the flow into the kidney. So sort of unloading exactly. them, if you will. But you have to maintain you have to maintain that head of pressure into the kidney. Um, yeah. So we're just trying to sneak off the fluid before the kidney realizes it. And the kidney is very sensitive to those perfusion changes. And if you can just find that right mix of how much fluid to take off while still perfusing the kidney. Now, in our patients now with this COVID, that's been a very difficult task because in those patients where their creatinines change, they go up very rapidly. They go from 0.9 to 8 in three days, and we've never seen that before. You know, it's just like, whoa. So we fiddle a little bit, and then all of a sudden, boom, we need some sort of clearance um, machine to help in addition to the fluid removal. Sure. And I, I, I want to change gears. Maddie, uh, can you comment a little bit on um, sort of two problems or two questions we're seeing in these people? Number one is the issue of proning, how often, how helpful. Number two is the use of sedatives and paralytics and the fact that we seem to be running out of them and what alternatives are we using. And the third is the feeding issue. Can you feed these people as you would otherwise? What happens when you turn them prone? Can you feed them? Uh, let's just start with the last one. The answer for proning, absolutely, we can feed them, so which we have it. Secondly, proning, uh, yes, in subset of the patient, we had a prior study that might be useful. And some of our patients, definitely, we've just started proning them since almost 10 days ago. We have a team, they come, and we prone the patient. How do you decide who to prone? Uh, the proning of the patient, usually we will look at it if they have a severe uh, ARDS with a PF ratio that they have, and then the oxygenation, we monitor the patient is going down, then it is selectively we uh, pick up the patient and then we ask the team to prone them. So it's not necessarily everybody going to get prone. Uh, yeah, how so long do you prone them for? That's right. Uh, for how long? Uh, the minimum is going to be 24 to 48 hours. That's the minimum of the proning that we do it on the patient. But as you say it, because of the PPEs and the uh, staff, uh, we are really concerned about uh, patient selection, who is going to get the proning. Uh, regarding the two other uh, questions that you're asking, it, as far as the paralytic agents, I um, agree we are in the stage of the shortage of the paralytic agent. And we try sometimes to use it intermittently, not necessarily put everybody on the paralytic agent. Moreover, we try to minimize it, which is sometimes is difficult, less than 48 hours on the medication like a Nimbex strip. Uh, regard of the uh, two other issues, I just want to add it prior to the question. One, series of the patients that they come to us, they have underlying either the CKD versus they have some heart failure, and now COVID unfortunately is superimposed on them. So we are very, as uh, Maria was saying, that we are very aware about the uh, volume overload from the time that they come to intensive care. So we are very conservative. At the same time, if they have a sign of the heart failure, we try to uh, use uh, the uh, Aquadex uh, on the earliest stage because we don't want to superimpose the hypervolemia. We try the LASIK on them, sometimes uh, early, and they are septic. Uh, I just wanted to, you know, because of the easage of the usage, uh, as far as the nursing, uh, if the connection is done and this machine can go run, uh, and then we have the ability to uh, manage the volume instead. Oh, one comment, uh, since you bring heart failure up, uh, uh, where do you use inotropes? How often do you get an echo on a patient? And how are you following troponins and, and CPKs uh, to help you manage the heart? Uh, the troponin and the CPK, we get it of most of our patients. If we have a sign of the patient, either we know the history of the they come or they belong to the risk factor, because, you know, some of our patients, they go to the VT, and then we get the proto, uh, troponin as high as, like, a 5. So they have a different sign of the myocarditis and the heart involvement. As far as the echocardiogram on this patient, because the right side is, doesn't have a good window, uh, we are not that much adamant of it to do the echocardiogram unnecessarily. Mostly we are just going to go with the CVP on those we know who has a, uh, cardio, uh, myocarditis. Uh, and as far as the inotropic, 
if the patient has a prior history of the heart failure and then become a hypotensive, it might be a usage for the inotrope in two cases. Basically, we just started some epi for the blood pressure. But uh, predominantly, we go clinical and the case by case. Uh, Giovanni, can you comment a little bit about uh, mechanis- mechanical support on these people? Have you put anybody on ECMO? What kind of ECMO? How do you cannulate them? So we don't we don't have ECMO capacity here in our uh, facility right here. And in turn, but you know, if you look at if the facility has an ECMO capacity, the uh, there's actually a, as a reference the ELSA, which is the extracorporeal life support organization, has some guidelines in uh, where when to put ECMO. Uh, when to put a patient with COVID-19 on ECMO. And that's kind of the guideline that I think the, the facility should follow if they have the capacity. Uh, it, we don't have experience yeah. here putting patients on ECMO. Maddie, do, do you have any or Maria? Uh, um, Maddie, this is Maddie. I, I have, uh, we have some patients on the ECMO, and I actually am part of the team that we make a decision for who needs to uh, get the ECMO at the referral center. Most of our cannulation is a peripheral cannulation. Uh, predominantly is through the FEMFEM. And uh, then we get the uh, very uh, selective criteria. We would like the center that they transfer this patient to us. We were involved from the beginning. We don't want a patient get toward the end of it and then they get a call for the ECMO. So uh, we have a, a group of four of us, and we have an ECMO team for, um, and as of right now, we're talking, we have some patient on ECMO. Maria, do you have any in Lenox Hill now? We, we send it to our referral center. They are doing some, but I don't know the criterion. Yeah, so just as an overview, it's a, it's a rarely used modality, thankfully. I had to estimate there's probably 100 or so been placed in the United States. Almost all of them are VV. ECMO, not VA ECMO. Uh, VNR2 ECMO is really reserved for those people who are in VV ECMO and develop myocarditis and hemodynamic uh, collapse. So it's a rare modality. It can be done two ways. One, how how Medi described with two cannulas in both femoral veins, one sitting below the IVC, uh, sort of um, at the junction with the liver, the other one at the tip of the superior vena cava. Uh, We tend to favor a single cannula, uh, the crescent cannula, which is through to, through to the uh, right internal jugular. Uh, you know, in many cases, we tend to we used to do these in non-COVID patients in the OR or the cath lab, but these uh, just for logistics and to minimize exposure of people and surfaces. These are being done with full PPE in the ICU itself. Uh, all these patients are anticoagulation. We tend to use bivalrudin, and I wanted to uh, ask uh, Maddie and Giovanni in terms of systemic heparin. Uh, for many of these people, are you seeing that you have to replenish AT3 with AT3 concentrates or FFP? Because we've we basically moved on to bivalrudin in all these patients. Um, we, we use the heparin. Uh, we had actually one case uh, that we uh, thought we give us some FFP, and believe it or not, we get a hard lesson as you. We switch it to the bivalrudin. So because they are Procoagulants. Um, so that's the reason. As of right now, we just giving the heparin, uh, and uh, we'll see. Except that one patient I'm talking. To. Yeah, yeah. In our experience, we so far we were able to uh, to obtain a good APTT, which is by using heparin. Yes. Yeah. So you're not seeing a lot of HIT. Uh, Atlantic HIT, no. uh, I haven't seen it either. No. Linda, are there any other questions from the audience? Oh, yes, lots of questions. Thank you. Um, during uh, the fluid recession phase, fluid resuscitation phase, do you consider using ultrafiltration while doing fluid challenges to control the fluid balance and treat hemodynamics? Maria, I'll let you take that. Uh, so, um, yes, I want to do that. I have not done that yet, but that's, uh, that's I'm on the precipice of getting that. I feel like they, you know, so you're right. You want to be giving these patients when they have that more volume because they usually need the more volume. So when do you have to quickly switch gears and get the fluid off because you you overstepped it too much? Uh, so in my mind, that's the clinical dilemma. And I feel it when I have the aquedex there, I could um, 
uh, I can generate urine output right away. I don't have to wait, you know, to get the LASIKs, to have the LASIKs kick in two or three or four or six or maybe not at all. So urine output on demand is the way I think of it. Um, I have been nudging my critical care team to sort of take this philosophy. So um, that's all just clinical supposition. I don't think there's any data on it, but that's sort of what I'm trying to do. Give them fluid. If we overshoot, it's okay. I can get the fluid off. And they're, they're buying into that now that we're into our third or fourth week of this. Maria Maria, Linda, any other questions? And remember, the yeah. audience, the question can be on any topic uh, regarding the pandemic, not necessarily just the kidney. Exactly. This one says, can someone comment of the binding of COVID-19 virus attaching to the one beta chain, one beta chain of hemoglobin and captures the polyporphin? And if this reason why we are seeing such a variation in oxygen delivery in general and to the kidneys resulting in AKI. I can take that. You know, there's one report from China that suggested, uh, trying to explain why such uh, hypoxemia when the lung pathology doesn't look so bad. And one of the, uh, this is a particular study, which again has not been replicated, but it's gotten a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, play in the social media is that virus binds by the mechanism uh, described by you to the heme and uh, uh, precludes him from binding oxygen. Uh, I think it's a very attractive theory. I just would not hang my, ha hang my head on it until I see more data on it. Great. Uh, another question is um, what the panelists say about an acute core pulmonary complication due to acute RV strain related to cytokine storm, fluid overload, due to renal failure, elevated PEEP on vents, and potential microvascular pulmonary artery thrombosis? So uh, let's try to get it. Uh, as far as the uh, microvascular uh, embolism, as I said, all of our COVID, when they come to the ICU, they get uh, heparinized. So we think it has some role. Regard of the RV strain, uh, especially if the, some patient is toward the fifth or sixth decade of the life and the prior history of the coronary artery disease, uh, is the possibility is going to happen on them. As far as the PIP, PIP is both is going to reduce the preload, but at the same time is the afterload reducer. And the one point I just want to say it clinically is important, and both of the morbidly obese when they get the COVID and they come to their intensive care unit, so the amount of the PEEP, uh, not necessarily the, as far as the guideline, probably we should put it higher because we want to take over of the transpulmonary pressure. So having all of those states, uh, I 100% agree with the Maria. So besides of everything is going on with our patient, we are very aware about the volume overload on the patient. And we wanted to see, and the, in certain point, go back to the two questions uh, ago, uh, the, when we wanted to put for the patient to work, working for the uh, extubation, we, are, we need a reliable way of the um, diuresis, at which the Aquadex can help us. That was a good question. So there's a lot of things that could uh, make the RV unhappy. One is microvascular thrombosis, elevated or pulmonary vascular resistance. The other one is the parenchymal disease itself. Number three is potential because of the prothrombotic to get, you know, big pulmonary emboli. Uh, Maddie, are you using inhaled nitric oxide, inhaled flolin in any significant way in these people? Uh, although the, the recommendation is very weak, uh, we had a few patients if quite young people, we have, we want to take care of that oxygenation. So we put them on the flow line and one particular patient we knew it, we just started the nitric oxide. It's buying us some time. And not necessarily, it's going to improve the oxygenation and we figure it out, as you know, Maria said, what we are going to do in the next eight hours or 12 hours, which way the patient is going to go. Uh, yes, sporadically we use these two modalities. Yeah. The other thing is the RV can be affected by the quote-unquote myocarditis. Uh, Linda, we have another question? Sure. Can someone comment on their perception of the prevalence of COVID-induced associated cardiac dysfunction that occurs in COVID patients requiring the ICU care? Yeah, so I think we've touched that uh, briefly. It's a very small percentage of people uh, from, the, from the greater denominator. Uh, some early indications are elevated, elevated troponins. 
or hemodynamic uh, 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 compromise. So if you have to see yourself escalating pressors or studying inotropes where troponin is going up or uh, uh, CPKs are going up, we tend to get an echocardiogram on these people. At, at our center, we're actually doing a study uh, doing biopsies and putting swans in patients with uh, myocarditis. So more to come on that subject, but uh, I think we don't understand what the contribution of the heart is to this process because we're not putting swans, we don't have wedge pressures, and we don't know if the heart's making things worse. So okay. yeah. it's, a, it's a good point, and it's a, the main trigger for uh, escalation to uh, inotropic support and in, in venoarterial arterial ECMO. Great. Another question is, considering operational and patient complexities along with patient and physician risk with invasive procedures, why not more frequently use ultrasound hemodynamic assessment? Use what? Yeah. For uh, the use of ultrasound hemodynamic assessment. Matt, you want to take that one? Uh, what we do uh, routinely, whoever came to our unit, they are going to get the arterial line, CBT, and they have any sign of the renal insufficiency, they are going to put line them in one session. Uh, and that's the major goal that you have. We use the ultrasound, particularly for the lung. If you should be suspected somebody developed pneumothorax or we want to look at the consolidation, uh, but routinely we do not use this because we want to you know most of our our bed in my unit has a negative pressure. We generate, uh, they put a HIPAA filter. Uh, so that's the reason we try to minimize the contact. Uh, we do not uh, ultrasound overly utilize for hemodynamic monitoring, except those conditions I told. Yeah, and if I can, I mean, I, I agree with Dr. Olumi 100%. I mean, I was saying the flow track for us is a very useful tool to that because it gives you a uh, real-time continuous hemodynamic monitoring of all the par kind of almost all the parameters that you need. Giovanni, what what is the name of that uh, device? It's a flow track device. Flow so track, and what is it exactly? It's a is a hemodynamic monitoring device. You just connect to the arterial line and to the CVP line. Yeah. And it gives you and it gives you real time the SVR, the stroke volume, the cardiac index, and the cardiac output continuously. You, you can and assess all your numbers while you're doing the managing of the patient in real time, the changes, without nobody have to do some one gun's number or anything like that. And it can be used on a regular A line. That's an excellent, excellent, excellent point. Linda, what else do we have? Uh, there's a lot of questions just discussing inflammatory markers, if people are following those, if there's any, um, if they've noticed or tested, if there's any decrease with um, ultrafiltration. So great question. So um, interleukins can be measured, particularly IL-6, but it takes a while to get those results back, several days, because they have to be sent out. Uh, CRPs, ferritin, procalcitonin, LDH, we follow those fairly routinely. The ones we do daily are D-dimers, because of the impact how, how, how aggressively we anticoagulate. Oh, I want to ask Maria, Maria, is there any data supporting any of the renal replacement uh, therapy modalities reducing uh, pro-inflammatory uh, cytokines? There, there is some data that's not so strong, but it's thought that the, um, it's more in the clearance modalities of stuff. So the aqueducts wouldn't be so beneficial in that from the data that I'm aware of. There is some data to suggest that the slow continuous, like the continuous renal replacement therapies might be better at removing uh, the, that was those cytokines. But there, there's not great data, but it's an area of investigation. Um, but I would like to add, in regard to those markers, you know, for, for those of you that are listening that have ESRD patients, we, as a matter of routine, get uh, ferritin levels uh, monthly on our outpatients, and we did our monthly labs, and, and two of our patients had a ferritin, bumps up in the ferritin to the four or 5,000 range, and normally they're running maybe five 600 which is typical on dialysis patient. Um, so I said, oh, my gosh, these people just doubled or, or whatever, quadrupled their ferritin levels. I was really worried about them. And sure enough, the both of them the following week got a fever and <laughs> came in the hospital. They both are fine. But I, I already said, I said, oh, my gosh, this ferritin, if we were checking it ahead of time, maybe we would know. But but that was like just really struck me because I've been seeing all these ferritins of five, six, seven thousand, ten thousand, twelve thousand, um, and then my outpatients who were fine had it, and then the following week got a fever. Yeah, you know, one so of the, just an observation with no other input. 
Now, there's a device called Cytosorb, which is not available in the United States, which is essentially a filter that you can hook up to either a renal replacement device or, a, or an ECMO circuit or a standalone that, is, that sort of adheres, absorbs cytokines. The problem is there's been no good data to suggest that it does anything, uh, at least in septic states and other high cytokine states. So I think that's why the FDA has not approved it. I think one of the scariest things about this, this disease is that the patients seem to do everything you need to do. They seem to stabilize, and then all of a sudden they spike a temperature to 106, 108, and they die. Um, and most of us are assuming it's just a massive uh, cytokine storm. Matty, are we do, are you, what do you do when you see a patient like that? What, what do you throw at them? Uh, a couple of things I just wanted. We routinely we measure uh, ferritin level. Uh, Maria said that we think it's a marker for interleukin-2, and then uh, CRP marker for the interleukin-6. That's one. We got this from our Italian colleague. Uh, second thing, when we get to the storm, uh, honestly, we give them a big dose of corticosteroids. Uh, you do? The patient day. We, how I much do you give for how long? We, uh, I had as high as 60 solometrol BID. And how much? Some of our patients, uh, 60 milligrams, 60. Uh-huh. Uh, BID. BID we're giving. We do not give a pulse therapy. And then those patients who are who's, uh, usually be after day 10, if the oxygen requirement is still is high, we put them on the corticosteroid, not on the beginning, but we just uh, giving them. Yes. Do you get a sense that it helps? Uh, honestly, we do not know uh, because, as you say, it some of these patients they look good and exactly the same experience we have it, and suddenly they deteriorate so fast. Um, I know some of my colleagues actually they are uh, infectious disease. Uh, they have it, their own criteria as far as the uh, severe uh, uh, severe COVID plus the duration of the disease. Uh, they just put the patient on the corticosteroid and they tapering it down. So that's I learned it from my ID colleagues. Yeah. So well, I think one of the most frustrating things is these people don't get better quickly, um, and you know the the, the length of the me- mechanical ventilation support is in the measure and sometimes in weeks, not in days. And the question about early tracheostomy has come up. Can each one of you comment on are you doing it or not? And if so, is it a conventional open tracheostomy or percutaneous? Giovanni, why don't you start? Uh, so I think the way we, I think we just treat it as a regular intubated patient when you, after a week you can start thinking about a tracheostomy if, if the patient is still intubated. In terms of which is the best way to do it, uh, we usually here we do percutaneous trach and the best side in the ICU with the bronchoscopy um, help. So that's, yeah. I, I would just that's what I was uh, that's that's kind of my opinion on that. So you just get a regular intubated patient and after seven days you decide what to do. Manny, what are you guys doing? Uh, we came actually in Sinai. Uh, I remember post day two. Five of us, uh, we can we create our own criteria, and we have a tracheostomy team. So our criteria as far as the patient, and we pick up with the number uh, at 10. Day 10, uh, we get the patient selection, and we do the tracheostomy. We can tell yeah. you as of yesterday, we have started this trach team. All of it uh, exclusively is a percutaneous. So day 10 of support? Uh, then 10, uh, patient selection. If the outcome is going to be, we think the patient is going to improve, uh, then we're going to liberate them from the all those heavy sedation and those things as much as possible. Yeah. Maria, any sense of how much tracheostomy is being done? Yeah, so we're not doing anything preemptively. I know that. Um, and, if, you know, I don't have the exact number, but um, but we, uh, I would say maybe, Maybe 20% of our patients, maybe 20 to 25, have prolonged intubation. So I think within the, like, uh, similar to the other two, you know, within a week, a week goes by. But we're not doing anything preemptively as far as I know. Right. Linda, we've come to the hour. Do we have any more questions? Uh, There's a question. um, It says, it is suggested that ACE2 is a carrier of COVID in kidneys and lungs. Does ultrafiltration compress ACE2 production? I do not know. I think a segue to that question, Maria, if you can answer, is that there's a lot of uh, controversy regarding uh, agents that uh, affect the renin and your tensin aldosterone system. Yeah. 
because of the so, affinity of the virus to ACE2 receptors. What's your right, thought? Should we see people yeah, on ACE inhibitors I, stop them? I have not stopped anybody. I just think the data isn't robust enough. Um, uh, now, that being said, a lot of the people that are very – so in the outpatient community, I haven't changed anybody. By the time I'm seeing people in the renal failure, they're not really taking too much orally, so it's not even a big issue. So um, so I would say that I haven't changed my general clinical practices based upon that. I, I just don't think there's enough data out there yet. How about using non-steroidals? Um, the non-steroidals, we, we ha like I'm not worried about non-steroidals in terms of the kidneys, if, peop if it's going to help. But we, a fair number of our patients are getting the solumedrol. So, um, so, we, you know, so yes, some of them are on. on, on, on. So I haven't had anybody stop the non-steroidals. People in the hospital are getting steroids. Terrific. So, Linda, we're at the end of the hour. Okay. I do have one question that just talks about experience with uh, – peritoneal dialysis, and then that notion of why not using aqueducts instead of peritoneal dialysis for these patients. That's a great point. Uh, we've run out of m machines or and or personnel, so we have the surgeons come into the room and insert these peritoneal dialysis at the bedside, uh, and it's been helpful, but I'm very curious what Maria thinks about in the the effectiveness of perineal dialysis, particularly in the prone position, versus using aqueducts. Okay, so the, the perineal dialysis is a wonderful modality. It really works well. The problem with perineal dialysis is it's, um, it's difficult to get it to work if you're a nurse that has never done perineal dialysis. And I would say traditionally we don't do acute perineal dialysis in, in the hospital anymore. So just to find enough nurses that could sort of figure it out and do it, again, that becomes a very labor-intensive process to teach nurses that maybe different nurses, you know, day shift, night shift, and tomorrow might be three different people, so on. Um, so we at our institution haven't employed it. I think institutions that do have PD programs, it's a wonderful use. In the prone position, though, you're not gonna, it's not going to work. You, you want to have the peritoneal dialysis catheter um, submerged in the fluid. The catheters are usually anchored back or po positioned back to the posterior gutter. In the prone position, your, your catheter now is sticking out. Then otherwise you have to try to move the catheter again. So it's only working half the time. Um, so we have not done it here. I, I, I do like the Aquadex equipment because I have more control over it. It can be used in any position. I just have to be able to get access to the, to the catheter. Great. Linda? Great. I, I think we're good. Well, thank you very much for joining. I uh, hope we answer most of your questions. And uh, stay safe and sane. <laughs> that was good. Thank you. Thank you.